opportunity to be here. Um, as Gene mentioned, it's, uh, it's been an interesting little uh, journey for me, and so I thought this evening I'd take a little bit of, uh, a couple of moments and sort of introduce me and my family and sort of where my fatherhood experience comes from. Talk a little bit about uh, some of the research, some of what we've done with about.com, and then uh, spend a little time talking about the basic principles that are included in the book, and then uh, just wrap up with a couple of uh, kind of random thoughts. So, so let me start first, uh, introduce you to the Parker family. Uh, my wife Julie is here with me, and our youngest son Grant in the back, who's manning the, uh, the tablet and scanner. Um, uh, this little photo was taken in July of last year, and uh, <clears throat> so highlights are five kids and four, <coughs> excuse me, four in-law kids, and uh, seven grandkids, and actually one on the way. And so we're excited about that. It's been a uh, it's been a really fun journey the last uh, thirty four years that, uh, that uh, Julie and I have been uh, parents. Um, so in addition to that, we have two dogs, like lots of families. Um, we, uh, we do not consider our dogs our children, however, um, but uh, we, do, uh, we do enjoy them. So uh, little Giacomo on the, uh, on the left is our uh, Lasso Apso. He's 11 years old and uh, he, uh, uh, works as a therapy dog, actually, in partnership with, uh, with my sweetheart. And then uh, Bridger, who's uh, a whole lot bigger than the last time the mayor saw him, uh, is uh, a little over a year old and is 100% uh, is, uh, puppy. So, uh, so we, uh, we, uh, we love them despite the fact that they uh, tear up the house and do all kinds of fun stuff. Um, I wanted to talk just a second, partly because, um, because my, my, my father influenced a lot of how I have experienced fatherhood. Um, in addition to that, it's a little nostalgic because uh, it's just been a month ago that we lost my dad uh, to a uh, battle with cancer. But, um, but uh, these are just uh, some shots through from about the, my dad's high school picture and then an early family photo and then mom and dad just right before uh, he was uh, diagnosed with cancer. And um, You know, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting. Growing up, uh, we, my dad was on the California Highway Patrol all the years I was growing up, so I grew up in a law enforcement family, um, which uh, brought its own series of challenges. Uh, and uh, but, but we had a great time, and um, you know, Dad, like so many others who were in the law enforcement world, worked two jobs, uh, did a lot of uh, was did a lot of night shifts, and so there were there were lots of times when Dad just wasn't around that much. Um, and really, you know, our, our relationship really developed uh, probably in my post-teen years almost more than the, than the years I lived at home. So we'll talk just a little bit about that. So why am I passionate about fatherhood? Um, you know, I think, I think my real interest, besides just being a dad, uh, my real interest uh, kind of developed years ago when I was uh, involved in uh, church leadership, and I worked with a lot of single parent families, blended families, and this whole idea of having fathers present and engaged became really important to me. I saw the impacts of, of fatherless homes, and we're going to share some statistics here in a minute, uh, that, uh, that kind of informed my passion about this. And I, uh, I came out of some of those experiences thinking, man, isn't there a way that we can help young men uh, learn what it means to be a father, uh, understand when they start, when they get married or when they don't, and they begin to have a family, what that really means and, and what it takes. So let me just share a couple of the statistics that, that have kind of troubled me. Um, this evening, as, uh, as we retire to bed tonight, across America, 40% of all children who will go to bed tonight go to bed in a home without a father. That's pretty astounding if you think about it. If you think about the nuclear family that we grew up with, the Ozzie and Harriets, or the Leave it to Beavers that I grew up with, um, you know, dad, was, dad went to work, came home at night, read the newspaper, Disciplined the kids, and then everybody went to bed. Uh, right? That was sort of the prototypical 50s, uh, 50s and 60s family. Um, that's clearly not the case anymore. So again, four out of ten will uh, will are live in a home where there's no father present. Uh, an additional 40 percent of those have not seen their dad in the last year. Um, so it's not just that the dads are they're divorced or they're shared custody. But there are, there are a sizable part of those fatherless families where dad is absolutely zero involved. 
uh, has not been present, has not been involved, and, and in many cases, being gone for more than a year, probably isn't current on his financial obligations with his family. Um, there's another interesting t statistic. 85% um, of all children who are diagnosed with behavioral problems come from fatherless homes. I think that's absolutely an astounding statistic. Um, and that's not to say that, uh, that we're that it's uh, predisposed that a child will be uh, will be have behavioral problems if dad's not there, but it does suggest that fathers could have more influence in the lives of their uh, of their families. And then uh, the seventy percent number, seventy percent of uh, of all uh, children minors who are in state custody for uh, for discipline issues. So again, in correctional facilities, seventy percent of them come from homes without dads. And so it just suggests that there's a lot more that we could be doing uh, as, as men, uh, as fathers, and as, uh, as male role models and mentors for some of these uh, fatherless young children. So a few other statistics, um, and some of these came a little bit from my experience watching some of these families. Uh, the average adult gamer spends over six hours a week playing games. Um, some of you will think that's a very low number. Uh, and some of the fathers I've interacted with, young fathers, uh, for whom gaming is a release, um, you know, it's probably a little bit more than that. 80% uh, of those employed 40 hours a week spend an average of seven hours beyond the 40 working from home. And so that's seven hours that, again, they're either not spending with their families or, in many cases, not sleeping. And, uh, and I've, uh, that's been a little bit of a challenge, too, I think, for a lot of dads. And then only 38% of U.S. employees are taking all of their earned vacation leave every year. Um, and so lots of us are not taking advantage of the opportunity simply because we're uh, wrapped up with, with work or other activities. So there is good news, despite the, uh, the negatives that we've talked about. Uh, so here's a survey that was done by the National Post a couple of years ago asking what are the most important aspects of being a good father. Now, candidly, I think I might have entered this equation thinking that fathers, the most important thing for fathers would be to provide financial security. Uh, the fact of the matter is that most dads don't feel that way. Yeah. On a scale of 1 to 5, 4.64 said provide love and emotional support. And boy, is that not the truth. Um, that's what dads uh, can do, being involved in your child's life, being a teacher, guide, and coach, providing discipline. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, the smallest one is doing your part in day-to-day -day child care. We'll talk about that a little bit too. Dads could, uh, could learn to do a little better in that regard. So uh, the percentage of mothers and fathers who uh, say they spend either too little or the right amount of time with their children. Uh, moms, 23% of them think they spend too little time. 68% uh, think it's just about the right amount. Uh, dads, not quite so. 46% uh, of them want to spend more time at home, and 50% uh, of them think it's about the right amount. So we're making progress. I guess that's kind of the bottom line. Uh, dads today are thinking a lot more about what it is that, uh, that they should be doing at home. So um, as uh, Jean mentioned, about 12 years ago, I began uh, writing about fatherhood and parenting issues for About.com. Uh, About.com is a, a website that hosts about 1,200 topic experts, and they, they cover the gamut uh, of, uh, of interesting uh, topics. And there's about 20 of us that are part of what's called the Parenting Channel, um, where we write about specific issues relative to parenting. And so, uh, so I, I have the fatherhood piece of that. There's also I have, uh, another a male compatriot in that group who writes about stay-at-home dads, so kind of a subset of, uh, of fatherhood. And then all the rest of them are moms. Uh, and so it, it makes for some pretty interesting online conversations sometimes uh, as we get into that. But, uh, but so the, the, the site about.com has been a, a fun opportunity to write a lot about fatherhood, to interact with a lot of dads. Um, I get uh, 15 or so emails a week from fathers in various circumstances and typically I at this point now, I try to refer them to something I've already written, <laughs> because uh, after uh, 12 years, you cover a lot of ground. Uh, but uh, but it's, been, uh, it's been very rewarding to, uh, to be involved at sort of a global level on the, in the world of fatherhood, but also kind of on a, on a granular level with individual dads who, uh, who have challenges. 
So um, again, about three years ago, I did a piece on about.com that talked about the top 10 power principles for successful fathers. Um, and, uh, and it was kind of a compilation of some things I'd already done. In addition, there were some gaps, I thought, in, my, in what I'd written. And so I kind of filled in this sort of principle-based concept around fatherhood. And this is what kind of uh, prompted the idea of the book, uh, was to say, could I take some of what I'd been doing online and translate that into a, uh, into a publication? Uh, and ideally, when I first started this, it was really about, uh, you know, there are fatherhood programs all over the country. Every YMCA has one. Lots of, uh, lots of organizations sponsor fatherhood programs where they either teach fathers or they take young men and help them be, think about fatherhood the right way. And originally, my thinking was I could do a little manual that could be used in those fatherhood programs to teach kind of basic, key basic principles. So you kind of take one a week and talk about it and journal about it and so on. And, uh, and so as I began through that process, I started thinking, well, these, these principles also have to apply in everyday parenting. It's not enough just to think about them and feel about them, but you've got to figure out what to do about them. And so when I, uh, when I actually did the uh, final draft of the book, about two-thirds of the book is sort of how you apply these basic principles to everyday uh, parenting choices. So why power principles? Uh, I, you know, lots and lots of parenting books are written that are very practical. Uh, they talk about the, you know, what we should do as practices, how to better discipline, and so on. Um, and yet I, I kept thinking as I was reading these and talking to dads about this, I kept remembering the Thoreau quote, that there are a thousand hacking at the leaves or the branches of evil for every one that's striking at the root. And I thought, well, why don't we talk about the root? Uh, how is it that we, that we help people develop a frame of reference uh, as fathers and so they can, again, utilize those basic principles in everyday decisions? So power principles, where did they come from? My father-in-law asked me the other day, so where do these power principles come from? You know, did you do extensive research? And <laughs> I, did, I said, well, some but uh, mostly kind of from my own experience and from watching others. So power principles came from my own experience as a father, what kinds of things worked and what didn't, what made a difference in the lives of my children. Um, experience as a church leader watching families, again, part of my uh, ecclesiastical responsibility, worked with a lot of blended families, a lot of second marriages, and, uh, and that, that's a whole different element uh, that you talk about when you try to take two disparate families and bring them together into one cohesive unit. So thought a lot about that. Um, observation of successful families and fathers. I have you know, tried to just be an observer, particularly over the last 12 years, of what, what really works and what, what doesn't work. Um, I tried to find overriding principles that encompassed others. And so I, I tried to identify, as I talked about these 10 principles, they're, they're all sort of super principles. They're bigger than, uh, than many others might be. And then finally, uh, focused on priority, uh, sort of things about putting family first. Uh, that doesn't mean dad comes last, uh, but it means we set the priority in the place where it, where it needs to be. So I started this little journey with the idea of four promises that I think successful fathers make to their families. And, uh, and the four promises sort of informed uh, the final you know, choice of what we did with principles. So the four promises were number one, the promise of sacrifice. The idea that we make a commitment to our families to put um, their needs at a very high level. Uh, we can't obviously um, give out of an empty bucket, and so self-care for dads is important, but we make sure that we talk about uh, the importance of, of dad putting family first. Uh, the second was the promise to love, and that is to, uh, you know, to, to put that, that sense of emotion, that sense of priority uh, into the lives of our family members. The third one was the promise of loyalty, that we hang together as a family. Uh, we're loyal to each other. We don't let people uh, you know, bully our fellow family members. Um, when there's problems, we address them. We don't just uh, turn the other way and uh, kind of sweep them under the rug. And then finally was the promise of wholeness, that we essentially bring our best self to this effort. And so we're constantly uh, working on um, sort of professional development as a parent. Uh, we don't just sort of wing it, uh, that we're uh, making an attempt to make really smart decisions. So as I talk about the principles, I want to talk about sort of two, two levels. Um, and those are sort of principles that relate to character and those that relate to competence. 
Um, we've been going through an exercise over the last several years in my, in, at the city where we've been working on what we call speed of trust um, and have been trying to improve the levels of trust in our organization because when you trust each other, things move better and faster. Um, and you, uh, you don't pay trust taxes that would cost you in the process. And so one of the things we've talked about is this idea of character and competence. And competence is, is what you see above the surface. It's the, you know, it's the tree in this case, um, but it's the, it's the behaviors that you see and understand as you watch someone uh, live their life. You see their competence. What we don't often see but is reflected in competence is the root system. And that's the character elements. What is it at their very foundation that makes us uh, successful as we, as we practice competence? And so the, the ten principles, five of them are character principles and five are competence principles. So I'm going to run through those just quickly. This is the, this is the free preview of the book. Um, and, uh, and so character principles, the first one is, and I've, I've called them all power principles, and thus the title power dance. So the first is the power of responsibility. And that is that we act responsibly as individuals and we teach our children to be responsible. So for example, we emphasize choice and accountability, that when you pick up one end of the stick, you pick up the other. Um, and that we allow uh, natural consequences to occur. Don't protect our children from the consequences of their choices. Now obviously, you know, you don't let children run out into the middle of the street, um, but uh, and, and sometimes natural consequences are not tolerable. Uh, but in most cases, we hope that children learn from their experiences uh, that there are consequences to our choices. Uh, the second character principle that I talk about in the book is what I call the power of your word. This is, you know, um, what I say is what I am. Um, and when I make a promise, I keep it. Uh, the law of the harvest, you know, is kind of, a, kind of an eternal principle one that, uh, that exists and was taught, uh, taught in the Bible, that uh, that which we sow will we also reap. And uh, we can't short circuit that process. You can't plant peas and expect to harvest potatoes. Uh, and so it's, uh, so it's about keeping our word um, and the emotional bank account, which is a Stephen Covey principle, for those of you who uh, enjoy Dr. Covey as much as I did. Um, and this concept that uh, every one of us has an emotional bank account with each other. And uh, when we make deposits, we make those by making and keeping promises. And when we need to make a withdrawal, we have to move quickly and do something that might tend to violate trust. The more deposits we've made, the more credit we get in that process. And so, so the power of your word is really about kind of those two key, key elements. The third one is what I call the power of the golden sword. And years and years ago, when my children were really young, I read an article by an author named Gary Smalley that was called The Two Swords of Power. Um, and in this case, uh, Smalley talked about, um, a, and used the analogy of a silver sword and a gold sword. He said the silver sword is the sword of positional power. It's the one we carry at work. So when I, uh, you know, when I uh, look at Gene Nelson, I say, Gene, I don't care what you think, just go do this. <laughs> That's positional power, right? Because he knows that I have control over things he likes to have happen to him. Uh, that doesn't always work at all. In fact, drain the emotional bank account when you utilize a positional power. Sometimes you have to, but you make withdrawals from the emotional bank account when that happens. And so the golden sword is the idea of personal power, and that is the power you generate by the force of your personal character. And so as you make and keep promises, as you demonstrate respect, um, and all of those things help you exercise personal power as opposed to positional power. So we talked about the principle of the golden sword. Uh, next is the, um, the character is the power of respect. Talked a little bit about that. It's the idea that we model respect, we listen actively. Um, Julie reminds me frequently as she's talking to me and if I'm involved in something else, she'll look at me and say, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> In other words, I haven't been actively listening. Um, and so we, we recognize that it's the importance of listening with feedback and having the opportunity to, uh, to, to uh, mirror back what people are telling us to ensure that we're listening. And then kind of walking a mile in someone else's shoes. The idea of, of trying to put ourselves in the place of others and understand what's happening in their world. Um, next, uh, and the fifth one is the power of character. This is one where we walk the walk. Uh, walk the talk, we, uh, we do exactly what we uh, say we're going to do. 
We capitalize on teaching moments. We're always looking for opportunities to teach and to uh, and, and just be engaged at that level. And then finally, that we're consistent and predictable. Um, one of the things uh, lots of fathers write me about is this idea of, uh, of the challenge of being consistent. And, uh, and children, children need to know where we stand on things. So then we get into competence principles. The remaining five are about things we do, not necessarily who we are. And so the first one is the power of communication. In the book, I introduce a model uh, of effective communication. It was done by a, a professor named Wilbur Sham, Schramm uh, years ago and uh, talks about the idea of encoding and decoding. And it's a, it's a very interesting model, and it's one that I've thought a lot about as I've interacted with my kids. I can encode lots of messages to them, but it makes very little difference how they would decode my message. So, uh, so it's important to encode it in the right way and, uh, and so they can decode appropriately and, and back and forth. Then we talk uh, in the book a lot about keys to effective communication. Uh, the next one is the power of presence. That's the idea that we, we have to make time. You know, we talk about this quality time, quantity time dichotomy, well, I, I don't buy that. Uh, you can't have quality without quantity. And so you have to spend time and you have to spend effective time uh, with your family and be present. Um, this example of big rocks, you probably all heard the analogy and Covey talks about it a lot, where if you've got a whole stack of things to make fit in a jar, um, you, uh, and you've got sand and pebbles and big rocks. If you start with the sand and then you put the pebbles in, there's not room for the big rocks. And so you have to start with the big rocks and then the little ones fall in and fill in all the spaces between and you get a, a full functional jar. And, uh, and so big rocks are the kinds of things that are important in a family. They're the, they're the best things that we do. Uh, the third one is the power of love. And uh, this one was really informed by reading, uh, for me years ago, the book, uh, the five, Lang five Love Languages. Um, and then we have to communicate love, not in the way we receive it, but in the way the person we are intending to show love to receives it. And uh, I share some classic examples from our family in the book. Uh, Julie and I are a good example of that. Uh, Julie is a quality time love language learner. And so she hears love when I spend quality time with her. I'm a words of affirmation guy. Um, words mean a lot to me. And I, I can live all day on a compliment. Don't even have to eat. It just feels so good. <laughs> and uh, and so, so we communicate and receive love in different ways. And part of the key that we talk about in competence is figuring out your child or your spouse's love language and how it is you should communicate with them. Uh, uh, ninth principle is the power of balance. And that's the idea that uh, any time we are out of balance, then we are out of kilter and things don't work well. And so it's about defining values and valuing them. Uh, it's about the good, better, best principle. How is it that we, uh, that we uh, make decisions about where we spend our time? And then making sure we create boundaries around, uh, around the time we spend. And then finally, the last one is the power of high expectations. And I get uh, more grief about this one from dads that write to me than almost any of these other principles. And they say, you set high expectations, your children will invariably fail, and, and they'll, dis they'll feel like they disappointed you. I said that we're talking about it in the wrong way. What we talk about are things like goals, uh, we're clear about our expectations, and, and we allow our children to not quite reach the high expectation, that's okay. And we communicate that that's okay. It's, it's in the reaching that, uh, that we make the difference. And then that we take opportunity to celebrate success. And I share some fun stories in the book about ways we did in our family over the years to kind of celebrate uh, success. So we talk a little bit about the book and how it's uh, structured and where we start. Start with kind of the introduction that begins with my first experience with fatherhood when my first child was born. Um, talk about kind of the, uh, a couple of the fun moments uh, there, but also the moments when I went home and absolutely fell apart because I had no idea what I got myself into. <laughs> and uh, I, I held that little guy for the first time and left him with Julie at the hospital while I went home at about 2.30 or 3 in the morning and uh, went home just sat on my bed and shook my head and thought, what on earth am I going to do with this little creature? Um, and then we uh, uh, had the sh some short chapters that introduced the ten principles. Uh, there are just a few pages each and they, uh, they talk about some of the key elements. Um, I then share an application analogy that uh, that happened to a friend of mine who was, a, uh, who was an ecclesiastical leader and where he took 
some principles and made them real in the life of a family in crisis. Um, and so, and then we talk uh, about some daily parenting topics, and there's about I don't know, maybe 30 or 35 of those parenting topics, and, and how to think about them as we apply the principles. So we talk about things like limits of discipline, there's uh, quite a bit in there, uh, about teaching values, how do you teach uh, patriotism, how do you teach honesty, how do you teach modesty, um, and uh, make, the, uh, make the principles work in those settings. Uh, talk about work-life balance, how is it that we figure out how to balance and spend our time effectively. Uh, talk about quality time. So there's some things about how to create activities that build memories and that uh, help us through that process. And then finally about showing love and uh, different ways that we uh, accomplish that. So if you want to find out more, um, you can also learn more about it at PowerDads.com. You can actually download a sample chapter and, uh, and learn more about what's in the book. Um, uh, Fatherhood.about.com is the .com site that I've written for for 12 years and, uh, and you can Go through and search and look for look for the articles or things that interest you, and uh, and then just on social media, uh, Twitter is Fatherhood Guide, and then uh, we are uh, just beginning the experience on Facebook, and so if you just go to bit.do slash powerdads, uh, that will take you to the Facebook page. It's a lot shorter than the whole lengthy URL, um, and uh, and like like the Facebook page and uh, help us start uh, kind of sharing the word. So. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much for being here. I'm looking forward to getting to visit with you uh, the rest of the evening. So.